Hello, and welcome to the Six Five Summit. I'm Shelley Kramer, one of the founding partners of Futurum Research, and on behalf of my team here at Futurum and the team at More Insights and Strategy, welcome. We're glad to have you. In this spotlight session, More Insights, Patrick Moorhead sits down with Simon Seagars, the CEO of ARM, and Jensen Wong, the founder and the CEO of NVIDIA. Their conversation revolves around the impact of NVIDIA's potential acquisition of ARM across global markets, as well as how it might impact the development of future technology. There are exciting times ahead, and this is a timely and interesting conversation that I am certain you won't want to miss. Let's go hear what they have to say. Simon and Jensen, thank you so much for coming on the 6.5 Summit 2021, day three. I think it's going to be great. And I've been looking forward to this for uh, a lot of time. It's great to be here. Great to be here. Here we are in 2021, where first off, semiconductors have adopted a lot of software, uh, but also when you combine software, semiconductors, and the cloud, uh, the real magic uh, has happened. And that's that's what I've seen, and I think I think you're probably seeing that uh, as well. But where I'd love to start, because the two of you are in some really interesting places running two very successful companies, what is one of the biggest things outside of NVIDIA and ARM uh, that you see happening uh, out there today? I would say that in the world of computing, uh, the, the single most uh, dramatic change is how software is developed and deployed. It used to be the case that, that uh, uh, lots of engineers got together, uh, amazing craft, we develop the software, uh, we get it tested to the best we can, and we shrink wrap it into a retail box, we put it on retail, and then we update it again once every three to five years. Uh, but the way that software is developed now, uh, and, and the magical things that it can do, machine learning and these large computers are augmenting the software engineers and they're learning from data and they're creating magic software. We call it artificial intelligence. And the thing that is really uh, quite different about this new type of software is that the entire workflow from, from the development of the software, the collection of the data, the training of the models, the, the deployment of the, the, uh, the service, uh, and then collecting new data, which then trains the model again, that entire loop, that entire loop is continuous. So and software, so, creating software. Software creating software, software is never finished, software is continuously changing. Uh, as a result, the world can't have these, uh, these uh, systems with all these uh, specific chips that are uh, rather fixed function, but the world wanted to be software defined. Right. So this whole concept about the world being software defined, uh, machine learning, uh, artificial intelligence, cloud computing, it all kind of goes together. Well, in both of your respective businesses, you're investing a tremendous amount into software already. And Simon, I think the same thing is true uh, for ARM, but what is super exciting uh, that you see in the next five years? Well, I think um, when, when we look out, this, the number of end markets that are, that are creating the pull on all of these technologies simultaneously. So when we've been through uh, growth phases of the industry before, it's generally been a market that's been driving it. But at the moment, it's like multiple markets. You've got cellular going you know, with, with the rollout of 5G, uh, which is really as a foundation for lots more stuff to come. Um, and then people are starting to talk about the development of 6G. Uh, you've got digitization of every part of our lives, which has been accelerated by the experience of the last year. Um, you've got things like electrification of transportation. Um, all these things are happening at the same time, which is just creating enormous demand on the technology industry to get behind it and create solutions. Uh, and building on something Jensen said a moment ago about how we used to package stuff up and it went into retail and, and kind of that was it. Now these things have a lifetime where the cycle is elongated. So a product isn't just sold, used, thrown away, you get the next one. So many things are turning into a service and that changes the way you think about design as well. Yeah, I'm really excited about the fungibility of, of compute and whether it's, you know, the deep edge, the far edge, the middle edge, the edge edge, the data center, um, and the ability to do the processing at the right place, which is typically at the point where a lot of times the data is ingested, uh, and the ability for that to have an impact on society when I think about the point that we do get to L4, L5 uh, out there. And that, that just fundamentally, that changes, changes everything. Uh, I see companies and I, I, I 
talk with folks who are being able to manage a hundred story commercial building with their smartphone, okay? Pulling together IT and OT in really intelligent ways and actually saving power. The two fundamental dynamics that Simon and I just mentioned enabled all that. Yeah. The fact of the matter is uh, because you can now have these, these, these microscopic computing devices uh, that are at the, at the edge. The fact that the software is not written as a packaged software that's dropped on that device, uh, but is orchestrated out to that device over a network, run like a service, it is possible on one pane of glass, the cell phone or a PC or whatever, one pane of glass, to be able to orchestrate millions of devices out in the world. And that's the future. That's, yeah. how, that's how computing yeah. is going to get and done. And it isn't that the software just moved from one place to another. The, sof the software that delivers the application is running at multiple places at once and interacting with, uh, with other pieces of software running on, you know, in a completely different infrastructure. And that, that's fascinating, I think. It's, it's really hard to manage. Uh, but I think uh, what you can produce with that is really fascinating. Yeah, and with containers gives you the ability to run, let's say you're at the deep edge, and that capability is too much for it. It automatically, there are frameworks that will now bump it up to the next level. It might add some latency, but it auto magically does this. So uh, literally from your smartwatch or your smartphone, you have an endless supply of, of, of opportunity. And that computing is done in the big cloud all the way down there, and I think that's great. So speaking of big things, the biggest news in semiconductors was uh, and is a potential deal between ARM and NVIDIA. I know there's a lot of questions though, and having the two of you say it is, is the most important way to do this. And I, I think the first is, why is this good for ARM customers? And maybe Simon will- I like yeah. the way Simon says it, because yeah. he says everything nicely. <laughs> <laughs> well, the, the, those trends we were just talking about, more computing is needed in more different forms, running more software, much more complex frameworks, um, and the, the, the end applications are, are limitless. So you know, right now we're looking at you know, everything we could do in a day. Uh, we've just got way more to do than we've got people to do it. That's kind of always been the case, but right now it's more so than ever. And as I think about the future, it's more so than ever. The range of products that our licensees want to build is growing and growing. What they're asking from us is increasing and increasing because of the complexity going up. And there's no way that we can do that on our own. So through the combination with NVIDIA, we're going to have a lot more resource to bear in creating an even richer portfolio of IP, of enabling that through the entire semiconductor industry and helping fuel the uh, delivery of all these really cool applications that are to come. You've never seen anything like it. And the reason for that is because we have two companies uh, th that, are, that are large and successful. And we're large and we're going to continue to be successful independently. However, uh, the combination is so special because the two of us are complementary. The two of us don't do the same things, and nor do we do it in the same ways for the same markets. And ARM is a world-class CPU IP company and the most popular CPU core in the world. Uh, NVIDIA is a platform technology company. We're about the peripherals, the accelerated computing, the software stack. We're a platform company. And so that when the two companies come together that are so complementary, and we do things that are so different, uh, the combination is going to bring new ideas and new innovation to the market. Uh, obviously, it's going to bring a lot more scale because the, the two companies together are just going to be a lot bigger. And the benefit to, to, uh, uh, to the market and to, to the ARM customers is going to be more IP, better IP, more accelerated roadmaps, and hopefully uh, taking ARM to uh, the far reaches of what is becoming what Simon just said, that, you know, the diversity of computing that's, that's literally going in every single direction. You're covering from cloud to edge to IoT, uh, to high performance computing, to microprocessors, to accelerated computing, I mean, everything. Because the, the breadth of computing today is just gigantic. And it was made possible by some of the dynamics we already talked about. And the way that people want to uh, use computers different the way people want to design computers is different. And the thing that I really love, uh, what, and what ARM has enabled us to do, uh, is design uh, specialized types of computers. And I happen to believe that this, is, this, this open way of uh, allowing the industry, enabling the industry 
uh, to create bespoke and different types of computers in this diverse world is exactly the way you want to go about it. Now, what we could do is just give it a whole bunch more speed and scale. The first thing I thought about was competition. <clears throat> and it's so funny, and I'm, you know, my company, we span the smartphone to the data center and everything in between. And my first thought was, boy, this is gonna be great for competition. And if I look at uh, the PC market, if I look at the data center compute market, those markets need more competition. Um, we, when, when I think about the, the way the end market competes, it, it's about you know, creating products, it's, it's doing new things, it's, it's innovating. And you know, re really, when I, when I think about our business over the last 30 years, what we've done is create uh, the, these building blocks that are really useful in all these chips, which saves people time. It, it saves people from having to reinvent the wheel. It means that they can apply their R&D resources on things which are really differentiating. And I think the more we can do that, the more we can put these tools in people's hands where they can then innovate around it, build on top, the better. So again, through this combination, we're going to create more stuff. We're going to be able to look at more markets at the same time, go deeper, go further up the stack, really understand the, the end applications through the work that NVIDIA have done over the years, and create a richer portfolio of IP to companies who are then going to be in a better place to innovate on top of a bigger platform and create even more competitive products in the market. So. I, I think this is only good for competition. For the vast majority of people I've spoken to, uh, the transaction is super welcome and they're super excited about it. One of the things that, that they love is the idea that NVIDIA's leadership in artificial intelligence and the software and the platform technologies could be brought out to the far edges of the markets where ARM is today. And ARM has great presence. That's where the ILT is going to happen. That's where the edge AI is going to happen. There's a lot of wonderful things that could happen out there. But the fundamental technologies of artificial intelligence aren't out there. In our combination, one obvious thing to do is to go do that, to bring NVIDIA's technology into the ARM ecosystem. However, there, there are a few people that, that um, uh, have expressed that, that ARM is best for the ecosystem as uh, an independent company. And, and equated independence uh, with, uh, with goodness. Uh, when ARM was, a, was focused largely on mobile uh, and one, com one particular industry, and at the nature of the development of the mobile industry at the time, uh, it, it, had a, it, it was a great situation. However, Simon and I both recognize that going into the future, uh, independence doesn't, doesn't equate to strength. Independence doesn't equate to vibrancy in the ecosystem. That in order to bring uh, computing out to the edge and to the new places that we want to go, having a platform stack, having software capability, having understanding and, and reach into the ecosystem, working with the developers in the ecosystem, that capability is richly valued. And we have an opportunity to bring that together. And so I think, I think there's, a, the, the, there's a fallacy in equating independence with uh, uh, with uh, strength and vibrancy of ARM, which ultimately what the customers of ARM want. They want not just an open ARM, an independent ARM, what they want is a strong ARM, and a strong ARM that allows them to go into these wonderful new markets. And I think it really is important to, to look at the future when thinking about what we're gonna be able to do. Because the, the complexity of, of the systems that our licensees are building, going up and up and up. You know, once upon a time, our, our roadmap was, you know, we had ARM 7 and 9 and 11, and they were fundamentally designed around mobile. And if you had an application that kind of looked like that, we had a product for you. We were able to create a microcontroller family, relatively low cost investment for us, didn't need a big software stack around it. It's been massively successful. You know, there's about a billion of them a month that get sold. Um, but it's, they're relatively simple devices in terms of the software and the complexity of everything that sits around them. Everything we were talking about at the beginning way more complex. There's the software stack, the interaction between these components. It's a different world in the future than it has been in the past. And we need a different approach to go and address that and keep providing all these technologies that our, our licensees are asking for. Yeah. And that's what we're uniquely going to be able to do. Yeah, I appreciate you addressing that because there obviously are some people who are afraid that they'll be competing with NVIDIA, who's very competitive and very successful uh, after the close. And I, I, I think what you said, Jensen, uh, uh, addressed that. One thing I want to shift to, though, is UK is very proud uh, to have ARM, and it should be. Um, what type of investments are you going to jointly continue to make uh, in, in, in the UK 
a, a post close? And how far does that commitment uh, go out? Uh, in the UK, in Cambridge, we have one of the world's premier microprocessor and IP development center. There are no equals. And it is one of the reasons why the CPU cores that have been made by ARM uh, over the years have established itself uh, in, its, in, in, the, in the way that it has. Um, the development of IP that is configurable, uh, that allows customers to use it in a variety of ways, it's, it's, it's on the one hand general purpose, but on the other hand it's configurable for all the needs of the customers. Uh, that that know-how is r really, really quite, quite difficult when you think about it in the context of computer architectures and optimized designs. And to be able to, to have, on the one hand, super, super optimized and, and super performant energy efficient designs on the one hand and have it be configurable in general purpose on the other hand, uh, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a tension that, that, that most engineers fail at. And, uh, and somehow uh, the ARM and the Cambridge ecosystem and, and the design center that, that's there uh, has, has done it at a world class level. We have every intention to, to not only continue to do it there, um, but to invest in doing it more there. There's, a, there's something that is really special in Cambridge, and you guys know this. Uh, it, it, is, it is the birthplace of, of uh, uh, computers and genomics. And we have a lot of partners in the Cambridge area in, in the UK uh, that is at the intersection of computational biology, computational genomics, and of course, computer science. And, and our opportunity here with, with uh, starting from that headquarters uh, is to grow that headquarters, but also to bring uh, NVIDIA's uh, ability to, to invest in AI research and robotics research and, and, and um, uh, computational biology and all of the, the, the capabilities we have uh, to uh, help UK become a center of world-class AI development. I think we have something really, really special as a starting point. And I, I uh, recently announced a, a, a supercomputer there, the largest supercomputer in the United, in, in United Kingdom called Cambridge One. And the excitement is, is fantastic. Did you talk the, about the investment level with that? Uh, Cambridge, Cambridge One, that supercomputing center, you know, call it $100 million, yeah. uh, just as a starting point. I mean, it's, it's a big investment. It is the most powerful supercomputer in the UK. And, uh, and the researchers are super excited about it. So anyways, I, I, am, I, am, I am so enamored with, with uh, Cambridge and the engineering team there, and, uh, uh, and, and uh, we have every intention to invest more. So export control has, has been a hot topic lately. Does anything change uh, with the close? No. I mean, export control is a function of where a product was created, who, the nationality of the people that worked on the product. Um, it's got nothing to do with the nationality of the company that owns the, you know, the, the, the product itself. So a lot of our products are developed in the UK. A lot of our, most of our products are developed outside the US. US export control applies to some of our products, doesn't apply to a lot of our products. So nothing changes when the deal closes. Let's talk about the data center. I love the data center. You all love the data center. How is this combination gonna make uh, arm a bigger player in the data center? The, the concept of a data center is a, a computer infrastructure that is secure, that is, uh, is powerful, of course, um, and that has the ability to support multiple tenants uh, running multiple things uh, uh, remotely. And so, so this data center could be a very large thing. It could be the size of a football field. Uh, it could be uh, a supercomputing center the size of a, a basketball court. Uh, it could be an enterprise data center about twice the size of that. Uh, it, could be, it could be a 5G base station. It could be a retail store. It could be a factory. It could be a broom closet. Uh, it could be uh, 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 all the way out on, on the edge uh, on, a, on, a, on four wheels because it's in, inside a car. All of these computers in the future are going to be very data center-like. They're going to be secure. They're going to be cloud native. They're going to be multi-tenant. Uh, they're going to be able to run AI. You will manage these data centers from afar, and uh, uh, and their data centers will come in all kinds of different sizes and shapes. Uh, the one thing for sure uh, is is uh, uh, we're going to try to make a contribution in in uh, servicing and, and enabling data centers all over the world. The applications are so diverse. The computing ecosystem is literally going in every direction at the same time, because of the things we talked about. 
because of software defined computing, because of cloud native computing, because of the fact that we could uh, wire things together wirelessly or over 5G, um, and very importantly, because of this new type of software development called AI. We can now put computers literally everywhere doing smart things, and we'll orchestrate it from, from uh, one pane of glass, like your friend. And, and so, so I, I think that the, the high level bit is that data centers are gonna be everywhere. They'll have some commonalities. Uh, they'll be secure, they'll be cloud native, they'll be confidential, they'll be multi-tenant, they'll be AI driven. Uh, those are the commonalities. What's gonna be different is the software stack that you run, run on top of it is gonna be completely different. Some of it will run VMware, some of it will run Linux, some of it will run Kubernetes on Linux. And there are all kinds of different types of software stacks that you wanna run. Some of it is monolithic, some of it is uh, you know, microservices and containers, some of it is right, disaggregated, some of it is not. And so all of these kinds of different architectures and implications on data, data centers is what really makes the computing industry hard. Another path that we know, Gelsinger, who's one of the veterans of the computer industry, he said there's a trillion lines of code on the x86. It's not untrue. It's not untrue. There's a trillion lines of code in the x86. All the peripherals, all the software stack, all the middleware, uh, that's one of the beauties of the x86. And so uh, what, what Simon and I would like to do is there are some s segments in the marketplace where, where uh, ARM is really quite perfect. However, there's a, a lot of software to do, a lot of, a lot of uh, uh, peripheral uh, technology to bring to bear, and a lot of different system configurations to create, a lot of uh, application developer ecosystem to go cultivate. Uh, and that journey will be long, but, but you know, we're two companies with, with a, lot of, uh, a lot of might. So Simon, I have to ask, based on Jensen's definition of the data center, will there be more ARM in the data center? That's the plan, <laughs> for sure. <laughs> That's the plan, indeed. I mean, you know, yeah. it's, it's, what Jensen just described <laughs> was a massive diversity <laughs> of, of, of what a data center is, requiring different solutions. And our business model is all about enabling people to build different solutions around common standards, so you get a lot of software reuse, uh, and so it's easy to build um, optimized solutions for the kind of problem that you're looking to solve. But it's an enormous space. And it's going to take a long, long journey and a lot of investment to really fulfill on the, uh, on the potential that there is in the data center. There's nothing more I would like to talk about products and products and opportunities and opportunities. But I get a lot of questions uh, from investors and, and, you know, talking to your customers. And uh, digital sovereignty has come up. And sometimes I call it the balkanization between, you know, China, the U.S., Western Europe. Um, what impact does this deal, how are you thinking about this digital sovereignty uh, uh, situation as it relates to, to the two of you coming together? Well, frankly, this is exactly the reason why ARM is popular. ARM gives you the ability to build your own computer and, and by extension, build your own computer industry. Um, however, uh, building a computer, a vibrant computer industry, takes more uh, than uh, ARM. It is the enabler, uh, but it takes more than that. And so in the combination of our company, we'll be able to provide an open CPU uh, ISA for a license uh, with all kinds of different sizes and shapes and scales. Uh, and uh, together, we're gonna build an ecosystem uh, around the ARM uh, CPU so that people uh, all over the world could decide what kind of shapes and sizes of computers they would like to make. And, and I, was, um, I was giving a, a keynote recently, and, uh, uh, and, and I noted there are supercomputers in, in France being built uh, with ARM, supercomputers in Japan being built with ARM, supercomputers in China being built with ARM. There are supercomputers in the United States, we're building one with ARM. Uh, we're building one in the UK with ARM. And so there's, there's all kinds of different systems and sizes and architectures and, uh, uh, that you could, you could create because of the open licensing model, because of the openness of it. I'm hopeful that we can work globally uh, together, but it does sound like there's pockets of IP in different places that will continue uh, to be the case. If a certain country uh, needs its IP there, it'll be there and, and vice versa. And remember, it, you want open, but you want strong open. Right. You know, nobody wants to build a weak computer. Nobody wants to build an inadequate computer. In order to, you, you would like to have independence, but uh, you would like to have strength with that independence. And so the thing that, that uh, uh, as Simon was saying earlier, 
the computer industry has changed shapes tremendously, and this is your, your observation as well. In the last 10, 20 years, the computer industry we're in today doesn't resemble anything that we came from. Right. And, and uh, that's the beauty of it. Yeah. Uh, that's the exciting part of, of our industry. Uh, the open architecture and open licensing model uh, is still incredibly valuable and more valuable today than before. However, a computer takes more than the CPU now because of all the things that we know about accelerated computing and AI and uh, different types of computers that are all over the world and how you manage it, how you orchestrate it, how you develop software for it, is all completely different today than it used to be. And so though between the two of us, we'll be able to provide the openness of a world-class CPU, the strength of a combined company that provides vibrancy and richness of solution and scale and speed of technology which matters a tremendous amount. Uh, and very importantly, platform and software technology to create these markets and platforms for the world. And what that does in doing that is actually drive down the cost of technology innovation, right? Because there's a bunch of cool stuff that we'll do, but you know, no one can be expert in everything. So you know, one thing I, th I think our business generally has helped do is drive down the cost of innovation of, of anything requiring a microprocessor because so much is kind of there and it works and it's, and it's great, you know, is there more we can do? Can we make it better? Of course. Um, but it's allowed people to build on top, again, spend their R&D on the things that are really differentiating, spend their R&D on, on new stuff and not have to reinvent the wheel the whole time. The nature <coughs> of a platform. Absolutely. Right? Stand on the platform, build something more. So the more we can do that, the stronger we can make it, the richer the IP set, we help fuel innovation and that's a great thing globally. Jensen, you brought out Grace recently. First Terra level chip it was a combination of your machine learning technology and you had a CPU in there as well. And I got a lot of questions on why did you, why do you have to buy ARM? Why don't you just license what they do? Here you have a CPU. You've achieved what you wanted to do. Uh, we've been working with ARM for a long time, and we've been building SOCs for a long time. Uh, and, and, um, uh, and, and in a lot of ways, uh, Grace is just the world's largest ARM SOC. It's a gigantic <laughs> SOC. And so it, it is absolutely true. Uh, we, we have a great working relationship with ARM already. We, we license the architecture. We don't have to buy ARM. NVIDIA is doing well. Uh, uh, NVIDIA has a, 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 a great strategy ahead. Uh, we don't have to buy ARM. We want to buy ARM. I want to buy ARM. You know, this, this combination is going to be great for the ecosystem. Uh, it's going to expand the reach of NVIDIA's ecosystem. Although, you know, these markets are, are rather new to us, mobile and embedded and, and others, uh, th these, these markets are going to benefit from AI. And, and I'm incredibly excited about uh, sharing our technology uh, in an area that we care very much about and very good at uh, with a billion devices a day. Uh, and they, they're all gonna be intelligent. They're all gonna be smart uh, uh, chips that are out all over the world, trillions of devices connected to the internet. That opens that up for us. Uh, what we can bring to ARM uh, is to, to uh, uh, complement uh, their CPU core. Uh, with the peripherals and the software stack and the system capabilities so that we can turn ARM uh, into, a, in addition to great mobile processors uh, and, and continue to advance that and accelerate that roadmap, uh, but to, to, to also extend the ARM uh, CPU into uh, computing worlds and computer markets that we're very good at uh, that otherwise would be too hard for them to reach uh, independently. And so, so I, I think the combination uh, brings, brings innovation to our market, it brings uh, innovation to, to, to ARM's market, uh, it extends NVIDIA's capabilities uh, to devices that otherwise are just nearly impossible for us to reach. And, um, uh, and so I, 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 I'm excited about that part of it. We, we've really always had the, the ambition to be in every chip. A number of times over the years, people have said, hey, you've got all this cool stuff for mobile. Why don't you just build an SOC for mobile? And you could probably have you know, bigger revenues. You go, yeah, well, that's interesting, but it's yeah, a market. Been one of those people, In fact, I think way. you have. <laughs> but I'd like to be able to address every market. And, and the definition of every 
changes every day. And, and that's where we, we're really going to be. That, that's what's, that will really change the game for us. Because uh, it just, just like this explosion that's going on in, in the end markets, the number of opportunities growing and growing. The opportunity to address all of that, I think, is what uniquely comes from it. So, you know, there are people that say, oh, you should you know, stay independent. But I think this is a much better outcome because of just how the definition of everything is getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And I want to address, be able to address everything. Yeah, everything about computing has changed in the last 10 years. Uh, the, the way we write software and the, and the software we can write, we call artificial intelligence, uh, and the applications you could use a computer for, and the way you design a computer, all three layers has fundamentally changed. It's really quite shocking. And there is no one business model that's perfect for everything. I love the idea that we could license an architecture to enable large industries, while in the select industries where we have specialty that we create solutions for. Those are not competing ideas. They're complementary ideas. I also think that uh, uh, as a chip company, um, uh, in the world of artificial intelligence, it makes no sense. There is no such thing as a chip artificial intelligence company. Artificial intelligence is about creating skills, software that has skills. In order to, for it to be an artificial intelligence company, you have to be rich with software, rich with AI algorithm capability, and as well as rich with semiconductor and processor design capability. That full stack approach I've always advocated as essential in this new world of computing. We would love to be able to refactor that capability and make available to licensees who would like to have it. And then lastly, you know, the computer industry, because of the type of AI software we can now write, uh, you could put smart cameras, smart microphones, smart thermal sensors, smart vibration sensors, uh, smart wheels, smart everything, all over the world, connected by the internet. We're going to have computers literally everywhere. And, and um, uh, that industry, that industry uh, it, it is brand new. And as, as Simon was saying earlier, uh, customers that, and markets that, and applications that we haven't even conce conceived of. That's the beauty of the ARM business model. Yeah, and that's, that's actually what I'm most excited about. You've got two companies with their own unique superpowers with very little overlap on, and sometimes at different spectrums. And that's what I'm excited about, is to see what the two of you can, can bring out there. You know, there's not enough competition in certain markets and there's not enough capability in certain markets to really move the rock hard, but I really believe that, that the two of you uh, can do this and I cannot wait to see what's gonna happen. And I just wanna thank you for making day three a spectacular day uh, with, uh, with the two of you. So thank you very much. Well, congratulations on your conference. I appreciate Fantastic that. Fantastic work. Thanks. Thanks a lot, Pat. So this is uh, Pat Moorhead with more insights and strategy uh, signing out for day three. Uh, if you're still hanging in there, we have a few more segments to go, but have a great day. <laughs>